Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Uh, you're all most welcome to today's SciDevNet debate. Uh, and we really appreciate that you've all joined us today. We know that it's an extremely busy time of year for a lot of people. Um, my name is Fiona Broom. I'm the deputy editor for features and podcasts at SciDevNet, uh, which is the world's leading source of news, views and analysis about science for global development. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover today, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction and I'll go over some housekeeping. I know that we're all very familiar with Zoom webinars by now, um, but just to remind you of some of the features, there's a chat box um, and a Q&A box. Everyone is most welcome to exchange ideas in the chat box, chat amongst yourselves, uh, but if you have a question, you'll need to use the Q&A box, uh, otherwise myself and my colleagues may miss your question. Um, and if you're putting a question in, if you could just uh, make sure that you indicate who the question is for, if you're directing it to a specific panelist. Um, and this event is being recorded today so that we can make it available to people who can't join us due to time zone differences. Um, I see that we still don't have Vicky, but let's begin. Anyway. Um, so communities in the global south are feeling the greatest impacts of the climate crisis. Uh, in about 10 days, the crucial COP26 climate talks will begin. And so we wanted to take some time to make sense of the upcoming negotiations and find out what matters to climate vulnerable communities in the global south. Uh, the COP26 talks are considered by many to be the last chance to put the world on track to meet the climate ambitions that were laid out in the Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, the Paris Agreement sets out a global framework to avoid climate breakdown by limiting global warming to well below two degrees Celsius and pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5. Um, it also aims to strengthen countries' abilities to deal with the impacts of climate change and to support them in those efforts. Um, this is particularly important for the global south, where the communities who have contributed the least to the climate crisis are bearing the largest burden of impacts. Um, last year's climate conference of the parties was, of course, postponed due to the pandemic. Um, vaccine inequality and UK travel regulations mean that many community leaders and climate experts from the global south will be unable to attend this year's event in person. Um, we're very lucky that today we have a wonderful panel of people who will be involved with COP. Um, some will be there in person, others will be engaging virtually. Um, so let's go ahead and introduce our panel today. So in alphabetical order, we have Alexander Antonelli. Alex <laughs> is the Director of Science at the UK's Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew. He's also a Professor in Biodiversity and Systematics at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden and Visiting Professor at the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. Alex is from Brazil uh, and his research focuses on the tropics where most species occur and the threats are most acute. And he has recently been focusing as I understand, on the application of machine learning techniques for biodiversity research and conservation. Uh, Inez Grace <laughs> um, holds a degree in water and environment engineering from the University of Rwanda. Her research focuses on loss and damage responses in developing countries. Uh, at just 25 years of age, Ineza is the executive director at the Green Fighter and is co-director of the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition. She aims to support the sharing of community voices through blogging, storytelling, and youth empowerment, especially young people in the Global South. Um, Martin Muchangi is the director for Water Sanitation and Hygiene, Public Health Emergencies Response, and Neglected Tropical Diseases at AMREF Health Africa in Kenya. Uh, Martin holds a master's degree in public health and is working towards his PhD in the same field. Martin has 15 years of professional experience in public health practice with particular interest in the environment and health nexus. And Martin and Amrif are members of the Global Climate and Health Alliance. Uh, Ritu Bharadwaj. Um, Ritu is a climate governance and finance senior researcher at the International Institute for Environment and Development. With more than 18 years of senior policy development research and management experience in government funding agencies and international NGOs, Ritu has worked extensively on social protection, climate resilience, forest and watershed management, resource, resource conservation, livelihood and gender issues. And Samir Kantawi uh, is the project manager for Egypt's fourth national communication to the 
United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's the UNFCCC. He gained a PhD in climate change in 2016 and has been a member of the Egyptian delegation to the UNFCCC conferences of the party since 2005. Samir was lead reviewer with the UNFCCC for developing and developed countries climate change reports and lead author with the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for the 2019 refinement of the greenhouse gas guidelines. And our final panelist um, is Vicky Tully Corpus, um, who doesn't seem to have been able to connect with us uh, just yet, but I'll introduce Vicky in the hopes that she is able to connect with us um, later on. Uh, Vicky is a human rights and development expert who was the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2014 to 2020. Vicky is the Executive Director of TEBTEBA, that's the Indigenous Peoples International Centre for Policy Research and Education. Um, she's chaired the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues from 2004 to 2010 and was actively engaged in the drafting and adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, so hoping that Vicky can join us um, as we continue. So let's begin. Um, let's begin by putting the climate, con climate crisis into context um, and finding out from each of the panelists what impact climate change is having around the developing world. Um, and let's also find out how climate change is connected to wider issues such as health, biodiversity and migration. Um, Ritu, let's begin with you. Um, how's the climate crisis impacting India and South Asia? Um, what climate impacts are being felt there? Uh, and how is climate connected to, um, for example, migration and agricultural issues or ideals? Thanks, Fiona. And probably I'll just talk beyond India as well, uh, because we've been working very closely on the loss and damage issues. Um, and then I say loss and damage, and I'm just in, in the interest of all the participants, I'll just explain what it really means. So many countries are now experiencing new forms or new types and higher intensity and frequency of climate impacts, which they are not adequately equipped to handle. And uh, these impacts are increasingly, um, and, and we now have started, we have categorized these impacts as loss and damage, where capacity of the affected communities or the countries is compromised to such an extent that they are no longer able to absorb the effects of climate risk or adapt to climate impacts. And, uh, and although we do not have a universally agreed definition of loss and damage, it is generally understood to occur when climate impacts go beyond the limits of adaptation of a particular community, causing permanent losses and damages. Now in 2020, you know, because we don't have an agreed definition, it's very difficult to categorize which impact is falls within the category of loss and damage and which does not. So if I talk about 2020 alone in India, we suffered record number of three cyclones, a nationwide heat wave, glacial lake outburst, flooding, which killed thousands and forced thousands more out of uh, their, their home places or native places. And if I talk about other countries in 2017, Caribbeans faced three category five hurricanes, which is unprecedented, uh, causing damages that many countries in that area was exceeded their GDP. And in 2019, Hurricane Dorian in Bahamas did serious damage. And there was there were so many storms that they faced that they ran out of alphabets to name them. And they had to go on to Greek alphabets. Now, but it is not just the problem of higher intensity and frequency of these events. There are also many countries are facing new forms of climate risks. Uh, so for example, you know, we have already read widespread news about heat waves in Canada or flooding in Germany, which was widely covered by the international media. But there are many countries in the global south which are also facing the kind of climate risk that they're not, you know, they're not accustomed to facing. For example, many Caribbean areas are facing droughts for the first time. And beyond these losses of lives, livelihood, infrastructure, or assets, these loss and damage, they're also creating secondary and tertiary impact. And Fiona, as you were saying, they, you know, almost every type of loss and damage impact leads to displacement, leads to forced migration. And when that happens, it exposes women and girls to different kinds of exploitation, 
vulnerability and slavery. And we ourselves, we had done some research and we found that in Ghana, uh, young girls and children who are forced to migrate, they are exposed to, you know, they, they're coerced into situations where they're forced into dead bondage or slavery by agents who run KIA and other forms. So this is just one of the examples. And there are so many evidence out there that, you know, these loss and damage impacts, they are creating secondary and tertiary impacts that leads to long-term uh, loss of well-being. Uh, it, it impacts their, uh, their mental uh, health, uh, leads to depression. And these are like secondary and tertiary impacts. And, and beyond that, there are also a number of uh, non-economic losses and damages. And, and Ineza is, is here in the panel. She can talk more passionately about, you know, because they are facing these issues right now. Uh, but the problem for Global South is that planning for or responding to or recovering from such unprecedented events, it's not just beyond the national budget. It's not just beyond their financing capacity of the affected countries, but they often exceeds their current knowledge, their skills and capacities of the government. You talk about civil societies or communities uh, because they're facing new forms of climate impacts. And and even if they know how to deal with them, the higher intensity and frequency means that the capacity is to deal with them is simply beyond them. So I'll just stop there and I'll be happy to address any, uh, you know, provide some evidence that any of the participants or panelists would want to know. Lovely, thank you, Ritu. Uh, and let's turn to now Samir. Um, Samir, Egypt and the Middle East region are famously very dry. Um, how is climate change affecting Egypt and the Middle East? Thank you, uh, Fiona. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning, good evening, good day, everybody. Um, actually, as it's very well known and according to the international reports by the IPCC, uh, Egypt is highly vulnerable to the risk of climate change impacts. Because the Nile, the Nile Delta, for example, is considered as one of the most three extreme uh, vulnerable hotspots, mega deltas, um, which directly affected by scenarios by 2050, uh, according to the IPC, as I said. So the national food security would be affected by the lower productivity of uh, crops and livestock, consequently from the increased frequency of droughts and uh, and floods. Also, uh, one of the main threat is the sea level rise uh, because uh, sea level rise would reduce the recharge rate uh, and uh, uh, the higher evaporation uh, higher evaporation rate will also extend areas of salinization of groundwater uh, which is resulting from decrease of fresh water uh, which resulting in a decrease as a fresh water availability in addition to that, uh, negative impact in, on, on ecosystem as well, and land use infrastructure and the human settlement. In general, the country uh, uh, economic activities would be uh, impacted. Uh, in terms of, of, of uh, impact of climate change in different sectors, I will not go in very much details on all sectors because this is, uh, currently we are working on uh, drafting our first ever national climate change strategy. The, in addition to preparing our national adaptation plan uh, so that uh, uh, we are following an, uh, an approach to uh, uh, assess the climate change impacts uh, on, the, uh, on the level of climate risks um, in each sector. For example, in coastal areas, uh, coastal zone, uh, it's important to have integrated coastal zone management for our north coast because it's very vulnerable to sea level rise, as I said. Also, uh, re reinforcement of natural-based solutions uh, for land protection through sandy dunes, uh, stabilization by the cultivation of uh, uh, wild plants and uh, wooden barriers, something like that. Uh, in, in, in water resource, for example, water resource and the irrigation sector, um, we have a limited uh, water budget. So uh, it's important to have water conservation measures, uh, particularly in agriculture, the most consumers of, uh, of, uh, of water in, uh, in Egypt, also industry and in uh, municipal supplies. Also, it's important to uh, have uh, some uh, uh, unconventional water resources uh, to compensate uh, the uh, uh, decrease of, of, of water budget. 
Also, it's important to cooperate with Nile Basin countries uh, uh, to enhance uh, precipitation measurements network in upstream countries uh, and also to reach uh, legally binding agreement uh, on the cooperation of any engineering construction may be uh, developed on the Nile base. Um, finally, for agriculture, for example, because agriculture is one of the most important sector in uh, national uh, economy, it's Due to climate change, it's important to have modern service irrigation techniques to save water and to change cropping patterns uh, and to have uh, mapping of uh, pathogens that impact the productivity of, of livestock and close the feed gap by introducing uh, new techniques and review new existing land use policies and support the uh, small uh, farmers uh, uh, in order to be uh, uh, adapted to to negative impact of uh, of climate change. This is uh, from my side for this uh, point. Thank you. Great, thanks, Samir. Um, some really in, uh, important points there. Um, uh, Martin, let's turn to you. What's the connection between climate and health, uh, and how are communities in Kenya experiencing climate change? Good. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Viona. It's a pleasure having you here, my fellow panelists and uh, our listeners or the participants of this uh, webinar. I'll first of all start by reflecting a little bit about how we got to these climate change issues. And we want to posit that it's all about the, the selfishness of human beings, because the moment when we had our population increasing, then that required that we also increase our capacities to produce. And now the bad thing is that we went in unsustainable manners uh, to deploy all the methods of uh, harvesting energies using uh, you know, uh, energy sources which are so pollute, pollute, which pollute to the environment. And at the end of the day, so what is happening is uh, we are polluting our land, we are polluting our air and, and, and all these kind of things creating a very unfavorable environment for the human being. Now, the result of that is a uh, symbol because uh, uh, right now we are experiencing major communicable diseases. Uh, we can see uh, communicable diseases changing even in areas where they never used to be. And for example, if you look at malaria, Highland malaria is now becoming a common place in Kenya and many other places in Africa where that never used to be earlier on. If you look at non-communicable diseases uh, in terms of the rank health uh, and, and the issues to do with even mental health, that's a major issue. Production of food in the southern part um, of this uh, planet is becoming a problem and it's because majorly the southern part is affected by the droughts. Or sometimes you get plants, uh, you, you have water which you don't need, and that is leading to displacement. So the total sum is that uh, if you look at the group of statistics today, you realize that over 150,000 people die annually because of climate change and its effects. And this is projected to increase to around 250 or a quarter million by the year 2030. If we do nothing also, by that year 2030, the world will be losing about two to four billion dollars uh, to health. Uh, you know, when you're trying to put up health system to take care of uh, the people who are actually getting into the health system, courtesy of climate change uh, issues. So it's really unfortunate that uh, the Grupo South is feeling the, 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 the greatest impact, but I really look forward to discussing the issues that we can put forward in a manner that we can mitigate uh, for this effect. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Martin. And do you have any um, specific examples um, of not just Kenya, but perhaps across um, Eastern or, or Southern Africa of how the impacts are being felt? Yeah, th this is common, Chris, and I would want to speak from a gross perspective because, uh, Ranjiri, if you look at um, populations that are living in the cities, courtesy of air pollution, then if you look at the graph, the health data, you realize that uh, asthma cases are increasing. So that's something which is very bad. And then uh, if you look at the ALMA data, 
Arma is one of the coalitions around the, where WHO has organized uh, countries to be able to speak to the issues of infectious diseases. You see that the cases of malaria and diseases which we should be able to eliminate in a very easy way are now increasing. Courtesy of new endemic zones that are created by the fact that now mosquito, which is the sector, is able to replicate in other areas. And this goes on to other communicable diseases, like if you look at neglect and tropical diseases, like trachoma, whereby you require water to wash your face, you require water to really keep the basic hygiene. But then, because of drought, water is dwindling in group of south. And for that case, the cases of trachoma, we are targeted as a group of community to eliminate trachoma by the year 2020. Now we are resetting the button again. And although we are setting ourselves for the year 2023, I'm not very sure. If we don't do um, serious interventions around uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, then those health targets are unlikely to be met. Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, uh, I, I can see that Vicky has joined us. Hello, Vicky. Thanks for coming in. We did introduce you um, uh, at the beginning in the hopes that you would, would join us. So everyone has had a little introduction to you. I'll come to you um, at, at the end of our list. I'll just turn to um, Ineza now. Uh, Ineza, what, hello. What, um, what effects are being seen in Rwanda from climate change and how are young people uh, particularly impacted by the climate crisis. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me? I have a very funny mic. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. And to answer, I will start by saying like uh, for us, uh, drought, rainfall, cyclone, white fire, heat wave are what we see on the daily news for the Kofoa global community, especially the one located in the global south, because we are feeling uh, the climate change impact to an extent that has never been recorded in the past. So we are like, um, we are the generation who is much more in the red, if I can say. Uh, and then we all know that climate change was a normal process until it became a man, uh, a man-made process or like any human-induced uh, process that meant it, uh, especially with the industrialization, with the use of, of, of fewer energy uh, that increased the greenhouse gas emission in the atmosphere. Uh, so for, for climate change to explain it in a, in a way, um, giving an example for my country, with, uh, in uh, 2020, despite that we were facing um, the, uh, the pandemic, which, uh, which we're still facing right now, we had a season of flooding and rainfall, and it destroyed uh, around 4,000 hectares of crop field. And to us, uh, especially our community, rely on agriculture as a source of economic uh, development, and we practice uh, mainly rain-fed agriculture. So when we are talking about those number uh, of lost crop field, we are looking into how in the, in the very near future, we're going to have a, a number of more people struggling with food security. And the most impacted are women and the young people, especially in the rural area. So, uh, so for us, is that that's, that's one of the examples of how we are facing climate change. And the, and the whole global community is, is exposed uh, but then the level of how we can all recover back is not, uh, is not equal. So some community can, can recover much quicker than the other. And this is a form of the climate inequality or the climate injustice that we are facing right now. Um, because past uh, developed countries have been uh, advocating to have, for example, the loss and damage finance for quite some years even before I was uh, quite aware that this kind of process is, uh, uh, is in place. Uh, but when a similar event is happening, for example, in Germany, uh, like we all know, like they hit it with the flooding uh, recently, but the government of Germany has like um, put in place a way to 
uh, to protect their community and allow them to recover better uh, by minimizing all the associated impacts, like uh, let's say education, health, um, even uh, development that their community are facing. But when the similar event is happening, which we all know is, is a current day reality of the global South community, there's no even one dollar. So it's kind of painful. Uh, it's kind of um, it's kind of like trying to be like uh, so like we need to step up. Not only uh, global North country, but we all need to step up and try to tackle climate uh, climate change impact in a, with a sense of uh, urgency because the IPCC report really pointed out very clearly we are all in the red zone and everyone everywhere is exposed. Uh, the only way to recover is to work together actively and by listening especially to the need of the most vulnerable because they're the one who were most uh, impacted in a, for a long time and uh, yeah and also bring back the trust because we are losing the trust. Thank you Anessa. Um, Alex, biodiversity is in decline worldwide. Um, these losses are particularly acute in Latin America. Uh, what's the connection with climate change and how are communities in Brazil experiencing these effects? Thanks, John, and hello to everyone. Absolutely, so climate change and biodiversity loss are intrinsically linked. Uh, what we're seeing now is uh, the deforestation of large parts of the southern edge of the Amazon, for instance, a lot of the conversion of the savannas, the natural savannas in South America, which are very species rich, uh, they are being converted now for agriculture, and that's for the cultivation of soybeans, uh, for growing meat, and of course that has a direct negative impact on uh, the amazing diversity we have in, in South America and Brazil in particular, which is the most biodiverse country in, in the world, uh, but also is contributing to massive amounts of carbon being pumped into the atmosphere. And of course, it has huge consequences for, for the local people as well. Um, I still have my family there. Um, I, I hear all the time about um, the fires um, in parts of the Amazon and the Pantanal, which is this huge wetland just south of the Amazon, and how that's affecting the air quality in cities across um, much of Brazil. Uh, it's increasing the impact as well with pollution. So it does have a very tangible effect on, on the health and well-being of people there. Um, I still have relatives actually in the indigenous communities uh, in the southeastern part of the Amazon. Uh, their land is being encroached. Um, they, there is a very clear tendency of um, trying to displace communities for um, agriculture. And we're not seeing any social benefits of that. So also, um, you know, you would think that just because there are more farmers and more area for uh, growing crops, this would bring social benefits, which is not the case. So they're very interlinked. Um, we have a, a huge diversity of, um, of plants, and that's our area of expertise at Kew. Uh, we have the world's largest collections of plants and fungi in the world. And we know that many species uh, in those areas are uh, very restricted to very small parts of the Amazon and, and in South America. So if you burn it down or if you cut it down for agriculture, we know inevitably we are losing species and we're probably losing them faster than we can describe them. And Brazil is actually the country where we are finding more species uh, every year. So each year, scientists are finding about 2,000 new species of plants and 2,000 new species of fungi, uh, many of them with very interesting medicinal properties, a source of food, fiber, but we're also probably losing a lot of species uh, with this uh, deforestation. So I think the key message here is that we cannot tackle uh, the climate crisis without considering the biodiversity impacts. And they also, you know, turn it around, we actually have solutions which will contribute to both climate and biodiversity uh, in Brazil and elsewhere. Lovely. Thank you, Alex. Um, I think some of that leads really nicely into um, Vicky. Um, Vicky, how vulnerable to climate change is the Philippines and Southeast Asia? And what's the experience of indigenous communities um, in your part of the world and, and around the world? Uh, well, uh, the uh, climate change has very serious impacts uh, in the Philippines and in South Italy, uh, in, in Southeast Asia also. But in the Philippines, you know, we have we suffer even without uh, the climate change. We have we always uh, go through uh, uh, 
uh, strong typhoons, no, which are causing a lot of problems. But this, the intensity of these typhoons have really increased considerably. And uh, when these typhoons ha happen, of course, uh, you can see floods, a lot of floods everywhere, as well as uh, land erosion. No, and uh, land erosion really causes deaths of uh, many people because uh, the, the places where they say usually you have these uh, big soil erosions and, and uh, their houses get swept down. The other thing is, of course, droughts. No, we have experienced droughts in long periods. And uh, this has caused uh, a lot of problems in terms of uh, production, of course. You know, both floods and droughts cause problems for food production, as well as uh, erosions. And uh, the droughts also have led to massive uh, forest fires. So the effect is, uh, is, is very much felt by uh, people, of course, who live in, especially those who live in high uh, mountain areas, but the ones who are living in the low-lying areas also are experiencing uh, uh, impacts in terms of the le level of uh, water rising and, of course, the the seawater going to their uh, to their uh, uh, houses. No, and uh, so this this is uh, this is these are the impacts on indigenous peoples in particular. Uh, as you know, indigenous peoples in, in the Philippines, many are found in the very uh, high, high mountains. And of course, they are affected by that. But also, uh, I think one of the impacts is that the, 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 whenever there are these kinds of disasters, uh, services, relief and rehabilitation services rarely reach indigenous people. So they have to depend fully on themselves to be able to adapt you know, to these changes. And uh, and uh, there is not much support you know, from the side of uh, government for that. Uh, diseases also have increased. Areas where uh, malaria, for instance, haven't been uh, seen. Uh, there are now areas where such uh, uh, malaria cases have increased, as well as waterborne diseases, of course. You no know? uh, waterborne diseases, uh, gastrointestinal diseases. And dengue, no, dengue is, has increased very significantly. Even here in my city, where we never had dengue, suddenly you have all this dengue, uh, the, the mosquitoes carrying dengue, and people are, especially young people, are very much affected. So uh, for in, for women, for indigenous women in particular, of course, the burdens for them have increased considerably. No, whether in terms of uh, production, they are usually the they are usually the farmers, but also in terms of uh, caregiving. No, for these uh, people who have uh, these diseases, and now with the COVID pandemic, that's another thing. And there has also been recorded uh, a decrease in in even in domestic violence. No, with the COVID impact, which of course is related very much to uh, to the misuse. Of, uh, of our environment, uh, the burdens of women increase. And, and there have been reported cases of increase in domestic violence because of the isolation you know, of the women being in their own houses. So uh, these are just a few of the impacts that we have seen. And, uh, and we are trying our best, of course, to adapt to, the, to this. Uh, and uh, uh, later on, if we talk about how we are ad adapting, I can share some of the things that the uh, Indigenous peoples are doing. Yes, thanks, Vicky. That would be great. Um, so I had a couple of um, emails come in from people ahead of today's debate, and they, they all sort of pointed to a similar issue, which was that when we're, we're discussing developing countries, we need to be discussing development models with the suggestion that current development models um, aren't addressing issues such as hunger and poverty and the suggestion that we should perhaps be looking to new models. But turning to COP26, in order to begin addressing these issues that you've all just raised, what outcomes do your communities need from these negotiations? Um, the provisional agenda for the official negotiations is currently about 20 pages long. Are there specific agenda items that each of you will be focusing on? Do you think that these issues will be getting the attention that they need from the international community and from the global media? And where does the responsibility lie for making sure that these outcomes are achieved? Um, Ritu, let's begin with you, if we can. Thank you so much, Fiona. And I'll talk about loss and damage because that's something which has 
featured in all the panelists' remarks, whether it was uh, Vicky's remark, uh, Ineza's remark, uh, and uh, you know, Alex's remark. Everyone's remark shows that climate change impacts are increasingly falling in the category where the limits to adaptation are being reached. And while loss and damage has been in the climate change agenda for a very long time, and within the COP agenda itself, almost since the inception of UNFCCC, people have been talking about loss and damage. Uh, but relatively very little progress has been made on tackling this issue. Uh, almost like three decades have gone by. And this debate on loss and damage has always been, the reason for that is because it's a highly com politically contentious issue and developed nations have been very reluctant to acknowledge the full implication of this issue with the fear of opening up themselves to the claims of liability and compensation. And this reluctance has actually resulted in very slow progress um, for the vulnerable countries in terms of securing either a political commitment uh, or the finance that is needed uh, to address this loss and damage risk. And you've seen like there are all the speakers before me, you know, in the panel discussion, they talked about the kind of issues that they're already facing. So loss and damage is occurring. And despite that resistance, um, you know, I would say I would I wouldn't say no progress has, was made at COP. Some progress has been made. For example, the first breakthrough happened in 2014 when the countries agreed to set up the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage at COP19, and this was then followed at uh, with the Paris Agreement, which which at least acknowledged it has its own issues, but it at least acknowledged acknowledged loss and damage as the third pillar for policy action alongside adaptation and mitigation. And then in 2019, the Santiago Network for Loss and Damage was created at COP25 in Paris, uh, in Madrid. But since 2019, progress on loss and damage has virtually stalled. Uh, and while UNFCCC has established a website for SNLD, there's very little progress in terms of actually operationalizing it. And, 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 and similarly, what we need to do is, you know, loss and damage does figure in COP26 agenda as you know, finding practical solution. And that's a very important area to address. But we also need to look into the issue of financing for loss and damage, which was in the agenda for COP25, but it is not in the agenda of COP26 in Glasgow, indicating a deprioritization of loss and damage issue in general. And many states and least developed countries and small and developing states, they're already incurring, in, incurring loss and damage of massive scale and they're struggling to recover. And, you know, and Vicky was talking about COVID-19 pandemic. It has shown that rich countries, and Ineza also touched upon uh, that flooding in Germany, that, you know, countries like Germany and Canada, they also face loss and damage, but they have the resources to build back better. And we have seen uh, during COVID pandemic times, developed countries were able, were able to push in trillions of dollars for recovery. Develop country, developing countries are not able to do that. So, you know, if you talk about some of these uh, developing countries or least developed countries, for example, I just give you the example of Antigua and Barbuda. In 2017, they experienced uh, two hurricanes, Irma and Maria, and that created a damage. You know, if you talk in terms of developed countries, it's a very small amount, but for them, it was 155 million worth of losses. Which and the recovery cost for that was almost 15% of their GDP. Which and we have clearly seen that these events are not like one-off event. The frequency of these events are increasing. So if their 15% of GDP has been wiped out, if they are going to face another event of a similar frequent intensity, then they'll not be in a position to deal with that anymore. You know, to so these intensities are increasing, and therefore clearly. Financing has to be an important issue that COP26 has to consider for loss and damage. And this financing for loss and damage has to be over and above the financing commitment that's already there, you know, not there, like we still to see that flowing in uh, for adaptation. So I'll just stop there and I'll be happy. But beyond that, I would also say that we do need support for practical solutions because, you know, almost all the panelists mentioned that there are different types of impact that they're experiencing. It could be from dengue, which uh, Vicky mentioned. It, you know, they, and they're not just climate impacts, it is creating secondary and tertiary impacts. 
So these, we need tailored responses to climate risks um, in different contexts. And for that, we need not just finances, but beyond finances, we also need capacity, technology, uh, institutional arrangement, a mechanism like SNLD really needs to, the Santiago Network Loss and Damage, it really needs to be operationalized, which can act as a marketplace which can bring all these different players together, share some of the best practices some countries are already doing. So yes, I'll just stop there. I don't want to overshoot on my time. But <laughs> Thanks, Risa. No, I mean, I think you bring up an important point there of it's um, that there are issues that are not on the agenda that are um, equally important. Um, Samir, um, I'll turn this question to you now. Um, are there particular points on the agenda or perhaps the points that are not on the agenda um, for the official negotiations that you'll be paying particular attention to? Yes, uh, actually, as uh, uh, my colleague uh, Rita said, uh, the developing uh, countries uh, usually focus on a specific agenda items. Uh, actually, the, the conference uh, agenda is full of uh, very important uh, topics. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I will not uh, participate in the next COP in person, but maybe virtually. But I believe that my delegation uh, will focus on uh, issues related to climate change adaptation and, uh, and uh, loss and damage. Uh, also, the climate change finance is one of the important issues because um, since 2009, I remember in Copenhagen, uh, there was a commitment uh, by developed countries to mobilize uh, 100 billion uh, US dollar every, every, every year for financing uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation 50-50. But this is, is this case is not is not happening now. You will see that the Green Climate Fund is yes, it's established and it's available in uh, South Korea and uh, start to finance uh, climate change uh, projects. Uh, but the mobilizing of, of the amount that was agreed or was discussed is not uh, is not uh, on the ground yet. Um, so climate change finance is one of the important issues. Um, also the means of implementation, including capacity building, technology transfer. Uh, uh, this, uh, this issue is very important for, for our countries, for developing countries uh, to deal with the climate change. And recently, uh, the enhanced transparency framework under the Paris Agreement. This is very important because uh, it's now it's a, man, um, it's a mandatory well, for, for all countries, including developing countries, to report about uh, uh, their climate change work, including mitigation, greenhouse gas inventory, uh, uh, mitigation policies and measures, and so on, emission projections. All these uh, very technical issues is is uh, now, it, it was uh, voluntary before that, now it's, uh, it's, it's uh, mandatory. We, we need to have our to start our national system be established uh, to be operationalized in a good manner and to build our capacities of our people. So these topics in, included in the uh, negotiation agenda or the COP agenda is very important. This is from my side for this point. Thank you. Lovely, thank you, Samir. Um, Vicky, are there particular um, points in the agenda that you'll be focusing on? I think there's some very specific agenda items that you are interested in. Oh, Vicky, you're still on mute. Okay. Yes, uh, there, I mean, there are several agenda items that we are very much concerned with, um, at least in indigenous uh, peoples. One is on Article 6, you know, the use of uh, uh, measures uh, for uh, emissions trading, you no. Know? And of course, uh, there is also a provision on non-market approaches, but a lot of the discussion is really on emissions trading, and we are very much concerned on uh, on how this is going to happen because some of the uh, territories which will be affected will be indigenous people's territories no they will be using the the uh, carbon uh, sequestered no in in our in our communities to to be included in their in the counting of their uh, contributions to reducing emissions and this is from developed countries because they are the ones who are capable of paying for the carbon uh, credits and what so the concern of indigenous peoples not just in this particular area but also in other areas like nature-based solutions is really the inclusion of uh, the respect for the human rights 
of indigenous peoples. No? And this includes the tenure rights of indigenous peoples to their forests, because the moment this is open to the, to, to the carbon market, then you can, we can already imagine that there will be uh, efforts done to, to get these uh, carbon credits. And of course, indigenous peoples uh, a uh, uh, free prior informed consent will not be obtained. Uh, they will not be able to equally benefit, no, from the from whatever benefits will that will be uh, incurred, among others. So uh, that is one of the agenda of indigenous peoples. How will they put in the language of uh, respect for uh, you know the human rights based approach, you know, in these measures that are being undertaken to ensure that uh, climate change solutions will not further. Uh, uh, result to the displacement of indigenous people from their territories, as well as the conversion or the the, uh, the policies that will not allow them to continue their own uh, knowledge systems, as well as their customary practices in protecting their forests, for instance. No, a forest is a very big uh, agenda item, and uh, and. Uh, uh, that is, uh, of course, many indigenous peoples are living or depending on the forest, and this is uh, their major concern. The, the issue about the, the loss and damage as well is an issue that indigenous peoples are also wanting to uh, to uh, engage uh, more seriously and uh, to put into the picture the, the impacts of this uh, loss and damage uh, to indig in indigenous peoples' territories and the need for them to be able to, of course, benefit from uh, building their capacities to deal with this, as well as uh, uh, getting uh, the necessary technologies and finances to be able to undertake this. Uh, the other uh, thing that we are going to look into is into this age of nature-based solutions. No, uh, it's there's a very big. Uh, you know, talk about nature-based solutions and even the finances that are being talked about now, a big part of that is going to nature-based solutions. So we really would like to know how they are going to undertake this uh, uh, nature-based solutions. What exactly are they talking about? This is just uh, related to, again, strengthening the capacity of, uh, of the private sector, you know, to do something and then label it as nature-based solutions and, of course, benefit from it. And, uh, and so the indigenous peoples again would like to to see that there is language on uh, on the protection of rights in promoting these nature based solutions. Uh, so generally, those are, I, overall, I think that the major concern of indigenous peoples, of which all of us agree on, is to ensure that these uh, solutions as well as the adaptation measures do respect indigenous people's rights and the local platform, the local and communities and indigenous people's platform on traditional knowledge uh, that is there and so indigenous peoples are actively participating uh, and uh, but the resources that are needed to enable you know traditional knowledge holders to really take part is also very limited. Although on Glasgow there will be a group of traditional knowledge holders who will go there who will present the solutions that they are doing. So so both the dealing with the issue of human rights as well as uh, raising on a higher uh, platform the contributions that indigenous peoples are doing and therefore should be supported both in policy and uh, and capacity building should be put into the agenda. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Alex, some of the points that Vicky raised um, have connections also with the the UN Biodiversity Convention about the um, access to benefit benefit sharing. Um, access to resources and so on. Um, in light of that, are there particular um, points on the climate uh, agenda that you'll be focusing on? Well, a very good points made already. Um, I think one of the the things here is about um, the huge difference in resilience of, of countries. If you look at the agenda, it's all very promising. But of course, at the end of the day, what comes out in terms of the decision and, and plan to uh, implement those decisions is going to be absolutely critical. So the devil is going to be in the detail. Um, I, I think as um, Rita, was, Rita was saying, there was a lot of focus on um, mit mitigation, but we absolutely need to do more uh, support for adaptation. And uh, there are of course many different areas when it comes to climate change, but a key, we really believe that nature can provide many solutions for climate change. And it's interesting that in the 21 page of the draft agenda, the word nature it's just mentioned a single time. 
um, and we really think that nature can help us. So for instance, um, our organization is working in more than 100 countries, and we have a particular office and uh, uh, collaborations in Madagascar, uh, which is, of course, one of the most, most affected countries um, in the world in terms of uh, climate change and, and social impacts. And, um, and that's really vulnerable. I mean, it affects, of course, poverty, uh, children education, you know, smallholder farmers, uh, risk from massive migration. And there have been massive investments to conserve nature, nature in Madagascar, but not always the, the right level of engagement with the communities that is needed to really make them successful and sustainable in the long term. So what we're doing there is really to work uh, to increase the natural capital across the country and work in collaboration with many organizations. Uh, because if you do that, um, you know, not only within the protected areas, and that applies to many other places um, around the world as well, if we increase uh, forest, for instance, around uh, outside the protected areas, that will reduce the pressure on the protected areas and prevent deforestation, but also provide people with the basic needs that they really are dependent on. So that's clean water, food, charcoal, um, income sources. So restoring those landscapes will capture a lot of carbon and help species and people. So I really hope that the decisions that are made at COP won't be detrimental to biodiversity and people. And I, I get the feeling sometimes of policymakers and politicians saying they're pledging billions and billions of trees to be planted without really having the level of engagement um, in the countries where this is actually going to happen and having a much more holistic view of what that entails. So it's not about planting trees, it's about restoring ecosystems and all the benefits that it can bring. Um, I think uh, you mentioned um, earlier that Q um, has made a recent declaration, is that correct? Yeah, so earlier this year we published um, the 10 golden rules uh, for successful uh, reforestation that benefit climate, biodiversity and people. And then last week we published the, the, the Q declaration on reforestation. And that was signed by over 3,000 organizations and individuals. So it's, it's not rocket science. It's just about getting the best evidence of how to do this in a sensible way. For instance, avoiding exotic, exotic species in the tropics um, and many other places, because the, the, a whole range of benefits by introducing native, diverse forests and working with communities uh, to make it sustainable. Thanks, Alex. Um, Ineza, what will you be focusing on? Are there some um, points in the agenda that specifically relate to youth? Um, thank you so much. Um, I would say that most of the points uh, are covered, especially uh, because what we are looking forward, uh, as I say, we are looking to a way to pave the way for a climate justice fut uh, future. And that will only happen if loss and damage is a priority. Uh, so most of uh, um, our most of what we are looking forward as youth, uh, especially the youth from the loss and damage youth coalition, can be um, can be uh, summarized in our loss and damage uh, uh, LDYC open statement for COP26. Um, in summary, what we want to see first is uh, a loss and damage finance because it's more than enough that the inequality and injustice uh, continue to grow. Uh, this is the right time to bring back better and faster as previous uh, uh, speaker said. And the other thing we want to listen damage to be a permanent, a permanent agenda on COPs, uh, not only for COP26, but also uh, beyond, because uh, we all know like if we don't have uh, an open space to having a discussion on loss and damage, we will be um, completely lagging behind. So we want to have like that space. And this includes, for example, making uh, a loss and damage um, champion for the negotiations so we can have that open discussion with the uh, different partners. And we also seek uh, the operationalization of the Santiago network on loss and damage to meet the need of, uh, of the community because we we don't want to have another network uh, that is only on paper, but without having an like, trustable uh, action on the ground that will, um, that will contribute to build uh, the hope for our generation. So we will, we will be watching to see how we're going to um, 
operationalize. And one of the way is to let the, uh, this network be a party driven and allowing the developing country to really uh, pave, I mean, pace the way of how we want this to be happening uh, in order to, um, to have a future lesson. And the most responsible partner uh, for having a successful COP26 would be the Global North part, uh, country or partners uh, because uh, we have been advocating for quite some time, but now I think it's the right time to listen and to act uh, in a sense. Other thing that we'll have to cover, I think my colleague really co um, they covered it quite uh, amazingly. So that would be one I can add on. Thanks, Inaza. And finally to you, Martin, um, which agenda items or or um, issues will you be following particularly closely at COP26? Yeah, very well. <clears throat> so we will be putting human health at the center. And uh, unfortunately, if you look at the agenda, uh, health is not a funding agenda for COP26. And so in this case, uh, this is first of all a wake up call because if we are not doing biodiversity, if we are not focusing on a healthy planet for the purpose of human beings and other species that live in it, then it will be more or less meaningless. And the good thing is that um, in collaboration with WHO, we have decided first of all to wake up and propose healthy NDCs. So as we do NDCs for industry, industries, transport, agriculture, and all that, we are waking up and calling for healthy NDCs. So that, that is mainstream within the entire climate change. Uh, next, I mean, climate change and health is mainstream without the climate change uh, interventions as a whole. And I want to speak to the fact that we are thinking from a system perspective. Number one, appreciating that it is an intersectoral kind of intervention that is going to make sure that uh, health is realized in totality. And when I'm talking about health, it's not just merely the absence of disease, but it is a total way of being, including the mental health part of it. So in this case, uh, we do have a proposal around how to look at it from the system perspective, and it is really looking at the surveillance data. It is getting uh, that surveillance data to produce early warning system from a system perspective that we can predict that because of these uh, weather changes, we are likely to have an epidemic hitting. And so direct collaboration between um, health and environment actors in a manner that preparedness can be put to the fore. The second thing is uh, direct community engagement and government engagement in a manner that we can advocate for investment in what I'll call um, building resilient health system. And this requires a lot of think through, uh, which encompasses technology, which encompasses pulling in uh, the, the resources of uh, metrics, uh, prediction, and all that, putting it in a manner that uh, then we can be able to, uh, you know, move from a one perspective. Um, the other thing is building the capacities of communities to be resilient, and especially looking at it from the health perspective. It's all about the uh, adaptation. Now that climate change is a reality, how best can communities, uh, you know, gain knowledge, the capacity to be able to adapt to the changes that we are already seeing? And lastly, it's building a whole picture about uh, resilience, uh, community health resilience that encompasses major philosophies around one health. How can human beings coexist with animals? Uh, have a healthy environment and of course take care of their own health in a total manner. So that is the agenda that we'll be trying to push, but above all it's looking about uh, where are we investing the money that we are speaking about. Whereas we are talking about financing, it's okay, um, the grant financing, how best are we bringing the private uh, sector financing into this and how is it directed? to create a whole big picture around 
health resilient systems. So that's what we'll be focusing on. And I look forward to a day when health will be mainstreamed within the climate uh, change uh, conversation in a big way. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, now let's um, find out in a bit more detail what you all have planned for your actual um, activities at COP26. Uh, I think four of you will be there in person um, and two will be uh, following virtually. Um, so if you could just tell us how you'll actually be engaging with COP um, and how you'll be bringing your focus issues to the attention of the international community. And I'm also just wondering, what are the benefits to attending the, per the, the conference in, in person? Is there a danger that communities from the global south will be less visible this year because of travel challenges, um, the digital divide, time zone issues, um, these types of problems? Um, Samir, let's begin with you as you've been a country delegate for many years. What's the view like from the delegates perspective at these kinds of events um, and how will you be engaging this year with COP? Yeah, as I said, uh, this year, this COP, I will not be in participating in person, but in virtual uh, manner. Uh, but uh, uh, my country has already submitted a proposal to host the next COP. So uh, we are designated to be the next COP uh, residency in Egypt. So. Um, uh, I think uh, my, my, my delegation will have a uh, very important uh, uh, role in to coordinate with uh, all negotiation uh, groups uh, in direct coordination with the presidency, the British presidency. Um, Egypt uh, is uh, a main player in uh, many regional uh, negotiating uh, uh, groups uh, like the uh, African group, uh, the G77 and China, the Arab groups, the like-minded developing uh, country groups. So uh, I think uh, my, 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 my uh, country negotiation uh, delegation uh, will need to coordinate with the, uh, as I said, with the presidency uh, in order to assure the uh, uh, guarantee the uh, rights of the developing countries under the climate justice uh, uh, principle um, to, in order to uh, safeguard the uh, developing countries' rights uh, during this, uh, this COP. This is for the, uh, from my side for this point. Um, and you'll be, um, you'll be following along at home virtually, um, I understand? Yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, the presidency announced through the UNFCCC website that uh, there is a um, uh, platform that uh, everyone can contribute in uh, side events and even in some official uh, meetings, uh, which is not close to uh, negotiators. Uh, so I think it's a very good opportunity to all people to, to, to visit the website of the UNFCCC and to register for the uh, uh, online uh, events, because it's very, very important that, that includes a very good uh, opportunity uh, for all experts in different uh, sectors um, to join these uh, this important uh, meetings. Thanks, Samir. Thank you. Um, I, I was going to turn to Ineza next, but she's saying that she's having audio and internet connection issues because it's raining, which I think really, um, <clears throat> excuse me, turns to our point um, about the digital divide and the um, challenges <clears throat> in the developing world of connecting virtually. Um, uh, Let's instead turn to um, Martin. I think, Martin, you've got quite a few events that you're going to be involved with um, yourself. And you're also, I believe, a country delegate. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Personally, I'll be joining virtually. And uh, the way we have looked at it, first of all, from a country perspective, there's a team from Kenya uh, that is going to join. And we are happy that um, the Kenyan delegation already signed um, 
a country commitment on how to build a health resilient, climate health resilient system. So that's something which we'll be putting on the table. I know there's a whole big momentum that is happening from South Africa uh, because South Africa incorporated health and disease uh, into the agenda. But now when it comes to my organization, which is AMREF, we have partnered with the WHO, uh, Pathfinder, Sanitation and Water for All. We'll be pitching uh, on the WHO signed events, uh, the WHO pavilion signed events. And what, what we just want to bring uh, to the fore is, first of all, we need to put the human being at the center of all these climate uh, negotiations. And for us to do that, we must appreciate that there are those who are most vulnerable. And for us to address the needs of the neediest, then if it is financing, it has to go there. If it is uh, the issues of adaptation and mitigation measures, we have to be conscious about how we are intervening within those kind of groups. So <clears throat> we will be pitching at putting women, putting the youth who are the majority in Africa at the center and ensuring that their voice is actually heard. And whatever we do is actually for the benefit of today and for the near future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, Alex, I think that, uh, that you'll be attending in person for a couple of days. Um, tell us about what you'll be doing. Uh, yeah, so we will be there. Um, I'll be there personally for a few days, but we are an official partner of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, so we will have a, uh, a special display installation there. Um, we're calling that the Carbon Garden. I'm not sure it's the official name, but that's in the blue zone. Uh, I must say, personally, I think it's a bit unfortunate that the blue zone and the green zones which will be separate, but I understand there are all kinds of um, security issues. Could you just well. quickly explain the difference between the blue, blue zone and the green zone? So um, my understanding is that the blue zone is where uh, all the political leaders and the, the high level discussions are taking place, and the green zone is for other organizations. Um, I'm not an expert on that, so please don't take my word for this, but, but basically, we know that um, within the UN pavilion, we are the only UK organization present. Um, so alongside Bloomberg, Facebook, and Google. So it'll be a nice play, a nice way of being physically present and trying to capture the attention of um, you know, the leaders walking around and uh, perhaps taking pictures of us. So if anyone listening here today is there, um, please do come and visit. Uh, so we'll have some plans um, and, and really trying to show showcase some of the work we're doing. And that'll be around issues on forestation and land use, uh, sustainable agriculture, sustainable uh, supply chains. Uh, we'll be discussing the Dasgupta review uh, with uh, Sir Partha Dasgupta, uh, who wrote it. So that's the, the big review on the biodiversity of the economics of biodiversity. And, uh, and also discussing best practice in nature based solutions uh, to, together with the University of Oxford. Um, so I think, you know, being there present will, of course, be hopefully uh, powerful. I, I, I do feel um, sorry for those who are not able to afford. I think now after COVID, uh, social media, um, virtual meetings hopefully have democratized uh, the sharing of opinion and um, you know, uh, information flow in a way that wasn't possible before. But we absolutely need to make sure that there's no alienation of voices, especially from the young people in, in, in low income countries who cannot attend so that their voices are equally heard and taking into account into making decisions. Thanks, Alex. Um, uh, Ritu, how about yourself? What do you have plans for COP20? Uh, thanks, Fiona. So I will be participating. Um, the like, colleague. Uh, Inesa, you want to come in? I, I, it looks like Inesa has just dropped out. OK, OK. So. Um, I, so like Alex was explaining, so there is blue, green, uh, blue zone and green zone. And obviously there are huge issues unlike the previous years uh, where we could access passes. Uh, the passes are very limited. So I, although I will be physically, I'm hoping to get a pass. I've still not got a pass, um, but I have registered for the green zone. Even there, the passes have become very limited right now. But I do have an event in the green zone where we're trying to 
highlight um, uh, one of the technologies, one of the approaches that we are using in India's social protection program, where we're trying to promote locally led early warning, early action to address losses and damages and other climate risks. So that's one of the events where we would be participating. But beyond that, uh, like you, you highlighted within your question, a series of questions. So there were many points within that. So you talked about virtual events compared to the physical events. And I would say there are pros and cons of both of them, you know, because many of these virtual events, uh, they are a welcome development, I would say, because it does create accessibility. So many people, I would personally not be able to attend so many events, which I am not able, which I am now able to attend because they're virtual in nature. But it's, you know, but it also has some limitations because they're very formalized. They're short, formal, and they are structured. And normally in a, in a physical meeting, it does have, it gives you some informality there as well because you meet people face to face. You get an opportunity. If you hear a speaker, you have the opportunity to engage with him off the, um, you know, off and beyond his speaking slot or he's on the sidelines of the event and so on. And, and that becomes a huge issue because now, now it's, and, and in past COPs, I would say some of the very good initiatives that we started in IID, like Life Air, these were materialized on the sidelines of COP, uh, where you go and interact and talk to people, understand their ideas, understand their issues. And it's not always easy to get all those issues highlighted in a formal setting, in a formal environment where people, speakers come and speak. So that informality, uh, you you know, that gets taken away from virtual events. And then again, of course, because of COVID, because of lack of access to vaccines, many of the partners that I know, they've got one vaccine. They are not, they will not be in, they'll not be able to get two vaccines in time. So they'll not be able to attend. So even though they, they can come, but they'll not be able to come. Some of them don't have access to passes. So there are a range of issues that this current COP will, will throw up. Um, we are able to manage some of that through virtual hybrid form of, uh, you know, hybrid form of these events. But I don't know to what extent it would be successful. We'll have to learn from it as we go, and we'll have to understand the experiences of these developed countries, whether they were able to, especially within the negotiation space, whether they were able to participate with their full uh, um, delegation, whether they had an opportunity to, uh, to present their views and so on. So that, that's still something that will unfold and we learn from it and get some experience for the next crop. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it actually plays out um, and what learnings that can be taken forwards to the next event. Um, it, unfortunately, it looks like we've lost Ineza. Um, so we will turn to Vicky. Um, Vicky, what are your plans um, around COP26? Uh, you're just on mute there, Vicky. Uh, yes, uh, you know, the indigenous uh, peoples have been organizing themselves and we have been having meetings so far, both for those who are attending as well as those who will participate virtually. And so we divided uh, the tasks among ourselves to, to make sure that we cover the, the breadth of issues that we would like to influence, whether this is on uh, on Article 6, whether this is on the uh, Warsaw International Mechanism, agriculture as well, you know, and of course the the, the global stock taking where the national uh, uh, nationally determined contributions are going to be discussed. You know, we want to ensure that uh, reports from the countries will also have references to how they have engaged with uh, indigenous peoples. No, but uh, outside of that, we have organized, uh, of course, several events. In the we have an indigenous pavilion where there will be uh, several events happening, but as well as uh, uh, our organization, my organization Tuba, is organizing uh, an event on climate finance, you no, know, to look into the, the the breadth of climate finance and how are these being made accessible, the quality of uh, projects being financed, uh, uh, and uh, and how these are uh, really supporting the, the communities that are able to contribute to the to, to solving the problem. Uh, there are also, we are also invited in some official events, like I was invited to speak on Nature Day by the, by the UK presidency. So I will talk about forest and land tenure rights. And there will be a breakfast in which the ministers will be there. And I think that's the importance of being there physically because, you know, uh, there have been no decisions made because of the virtual nature of the discussion so far. 
So many of the decisions will be made there. So it will be important to be able to go to some of these meetings or uh, even uh, non-state players are allowed so that we will be able to see the progress of the uh, discussions happening and the decisions that are going to be made. So, uh, of course, we are there to present as well the solution. So the, 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 local, the local communities and indigenous peoples platform, we have several, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, traditional knowledge holders. So we'll be having also a series of activities uh, sharing what the knowledge, the traditional knowledge that they are using to address the issue of climate change. And, uh, and one of the things that we also would like to see is really an integrated agenda, you know, where they talk about biodiversity, when they talk about nature-based solutions, it's linked to biodiversity, as well as, of course, the food security and, uh, and the sustainable development goals. So that's one of the objectives that we have. How do we make sure that these different arenas are really talking, you know, uh, along the same lines, and not uh, and not just uh, you know uh, doing their own things without in, without coordinating and collaborating with each other. So those are some of the things that we are going to do in Glasgow. And there will be a significant number of indigenous peoples. There will be mainly from the Amazon, for instance, who will be there, and uh, they will try uh, whatever they can to also engage with the with the various negotiations happening. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be, I mean, the, the climate cops are always action packed, but it seems like this year will be particularly <laughs> exciting. So we're just moving into the final 10 minutes. Um, and mm -hmm. I thought um, uh, a good way to sort of wrap up would be to ask all of you to um, just sort of summarize your main points very briefly. But while we're doing that, um, those of you in the audience, uh, we'd love if you could um, also sum up just in a couple of words, what you'll be focusing on at COP26, if there's something particular that you're interested in, um, or if there, there are any particular impacts of climate change um, that you are focusing on. So if you'd like to do that, you can just post in, uh, in the chat box, you can just pop your comments in there. Um, and so I'll just turn back to the panelists now. Um, in Just in sort of 60 seconds, um, could each of you, sum up your final message, uh, what action or actions are you calling for from COP26? I'll just move across the screen left to right. Martin, let's begin with you. Yeah, sure. Maybe let me say that a healthy planet is a healthy people. And so each and every one of us must be very conscious in terms of the negotiations and the developments that are going to follow, that we should stop being selfish and and focus on how, first of all, we can make the planet healthy and ensure that it is sustains us today and it is sustains the future generation. So thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, and Vicky, how about you? Sorry, Vicky, you're on mute. Yes, uh, we. Uh, for me, uh, what I would like to see is really the, in, the inclusion of uh, safeguards and human rights into many of these solutions being discussed. I think that it's important that the safe, the, there will be safeguards put in place so that these solutions will not further uh, marginalize uh, indigenous peoples. And these uh, solutions will also include them. There will be participation of indigenous peoples in deciding how these uh, solutions are being made, especially as it concerns their lands, territories, and resources, and of course, their traditional knowledge. Thank you, Vicky. And Ritu. Thanks, Fiona. For me, the most important issue right now is loss and damage because it is happening now. And vulnerable countries and communities around the world, they're losing their lives, their livelihood, uh, their homes, they're getting displaced. People, for example, in Bangladesh are getting displaced six to seven times from their homes. Uh, so this is an urgent issue. It is creating secondary and tertiary impacts so these are the impacts that we only value in economic terms, but they are far-reaching secondary and tertiary impacts that all panelists have uh, highlighted. So we need to, you know, and th these issues will only escalate uh, with, as climate change impact will get worsened. So we need urgent action at scale uh, because without that, millions of lives would be put at risk. 
So, uh, and this requires commitment for finances, resources, capacity, infrastructure for the vulnerable countries to help them prepare, uh, adapt, and recover from these impact, impacts. Thanks, Ritu. Um, and Alex. Thanks. I think the key message we're trying to get across is that nature is really critical uh, part of climate action. So to reach net zero that everyone's talking about, we need nature-based solutions. Uh, so we cannot tackle the climate change without tackling biodiversity loss. And we know nature can help protect communities and habitats from the impact of climate change and capture carbon. And restoring forests and other ecosystems is very key, but protecting existing forests must always be the first priority. So protecting what we have left it's much better, much cheaper. And if we do restore, governments need to do it well, you know, get it right. So right tree in the right place for the right outcome. So um, there's been a lot of very nice, uh, wise words said by the panelists here today, but I want to just reiterate what our young panelist Ineza said uh, about actions rather than words. And um, in the last decade, we completely failed uh, achieving the IG targets for biodiversity, so 19 targets, which all of them uh, were not fully met, we need to do it differently. We need to see action. We, we need to see a plan uh, and the right finances to, to get it right this decade, because it may be the last one we have an opportunity to make a change. Thanks, Alex. Um, and finally, Samir. Yes, uh, like uh previous speakers, colleagues, I think um, my message will be to the world leaders to stop, please stop talking and uh, start to act. Uh, we are in very critical uh, time, according to the science, the IBC uh, recent reports. Uh, it's time for action uh, and stop talking um, in order to do something to save the, the Earth's uh, planet, uh, for us and for the next generation and everyone know what's needed to be to be done and uh, what he can or or, or uh, uh, every country can can do thank you thank you samir um and thanks to you all um i think vicky said that she had to leave and it seems that unfortunately aneza was unable to reconnect uh, so it looks like we've come to the end of our event today. Um, thank you very much to everybody for joining us. There was a question, um, I think, earlier as to whether SciDevNet would be writing this up. Yes, we will be um, producing a news article and the full recording um, will be uh, shared on SciDevNet. So you'll be able to forward that along to uh, any of your colleagues who may have been unable to join us today. Um, so if there are no further questions coming in from the audience, thank you, Oris. Um, yes, once again, a thousand thanks to our panel for making yourselves available and for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I look forward to meeting some of you very shortly in Glasgow. Um, and I wish everybody good health uh, and I'll see you soon. Thank you very much.